Let us pray. Almighty God, we give you thanks for your goodness and your grace to us, and we thank you that even this day you have fed us by your word and by your sacrament, and we pray that you would give to us faithful hearts that we might love you and follow you, that we might redeem the time to the glory of your name. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we have here uh, at the top uh, our catechism that we are saying, um, and our catechism uh, uh, sections for today are relatively short. Um, our catechism for today um, is after the, uh, the confirmand is supposed to recite uh, the, uh, the Apostles' Creed. So if you are somebody who uh, may be confirmed uh, this uh, spring when Bishop Manto comes and visits us once again, um, I commend to you to begin memorizing the Apostles' Creed, uh, the Lord's Prayer, the Ten Commandments, because these are things in the Catechism you're called to, to, called to memorize. Um, and then we're going to also have further instruction on these things, of course, um, going into January and February. But here, uh, so after reciting the Apostles' Creed, we say this, uh, and everyone can, uh, of course, answer with the answer here. What dost thou chiefly learn in these articles of thy belief? good. So we have there um, uh, an exposition, very, very brief exposition of the Apostles' Creed, um, particularly uh, in the Trinitarian um, emphasis of the Apostles' Creed. Okay. So our subject for today, uh, as we continue to think about Proverbs, is today we're going to think about uh, the title there, Poverty, Wealth, and Proverbs. Poverty, Wealth, and and Proverbs. There's a lot in Proverbs about a work, about wealth, about poverty. There is much for us here to consider and to think about. And as we do so, I want to just give some of the background here as uh, how we think about um, these things. Um, one thing to sort of remember at the outset, right at the beginning, is that all material things ultimately have their source in God's good creation of the world. Right? God creates the world and gives the world as a gift to human beings, to men and women. Right? So from the very beginning with Adam and Eve in the garden, there is gift right, of, the, of things, possessions. Um, and we, do not, we, would not, we would not say that things or money are, are, are bad or are wicked. Because all things are gifts of God. And we even see in the Old Testament that some Old Testament figures were very rich men. Right? Abraham um, and Lot. Solomon himself, who writes many of the Proverbs, uh, was very wealthy. Right? He was a very rich man. Um, so being a very rich person is not wicked or bad to be a rich or wealthy person. And yet... Scripture very clearly and over and over again cautions us to not love riches. It cautions us to be wise in how we think about wealth and how we think about riches. So we see, for instance, uh, Amos. And this is even in the Old Testament prophetic tradition, right? Amos says in Amos chapter 8, verse 4, Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, when will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn and the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel great and falsifying the balances by deceit that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. The Lord hath sworn by the excellency of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. There's this warning there about oppressing the poor. Right? And who is it that would oppress the poor? Those who have more money than they have. Right? It might be other poor people, but it's those who have more than they do. Right? And why would they be motivated to oppress the poor? What motivates people to change the ephah? Or to say, oh boy, I can't wait until I can 
uh, to, can sell them things again and overcharge them for the things they're buying. The love of money, right? And so it, there's this warning here of the love of money. We see in the Magnificat, right? Mary says in the Magnificat. What does Mary say about riches in the Magnificat? He hath put down the mighty from their seat and hath exalted the humble and meek. Right. So in the Magnificat, Mary says, he hath put down the mighty from their seat. He hath filled the hungry with good things and the rich he hath sent empty away. So there's this warning there about about money, right? And actually this statement that those who are oppressing, the rich will be sent away, but he, God exalts the humble and the meek. Jesus tells us in Matthew, you can't serve two masters, right? Matthew chapter six is in the Sermon on the Mount. No man can serve two masters, the other he will hate the one and love the other or hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and money. Or later in Matthew, as Jesus is teaching, he says in Matthew chapter 19, Verily I say to you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. Which the King James Version means diff with difficulty. It's going to be difficult for them to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, with men this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Yes. I think that that's one way of looking at this. In other words, that the, the disciples are amazed that he says it's going to be difficult for the rich to enter the kingdom of God because the thought would have been, the rich so evidently have received God's blessings that therefore they must be the ones who are blessed and going to enter the kingdom of God. And here, Jesus is warning, he, he's subverting that expectation. <laughs> he's warning to check that, ex to, check that, to, um, to not have that as the expectation. Right? That, um, that riches can be a snare. They can be dangerous. It can be d it's difficult for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Now, is it difficult for anyone to enter the kingdom of God? Yes, right? right. Jesus has to go to the cross to die to make the way for, the kingdom of, to any, for any to enter the kingdom of God. But it's important to notice that he does expressly here focus on the rich. So it's important that we notice that. And, and by the way, you know, when we think about what it means to be rich, most of us here would qualify. Like when you think about the world globally, when you think about world history, the amount of money and security from money that we have is quite remarkable. And so these types of statements are ones that we need to attend to in our own lives. And um, the Apostle Paul teaches Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, um, 1 Timothy 6, verse 17, charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded. Because what can riches often lead to? Self-reliance, high-mindedness, pride in self. It says, charge them that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy, that they do good, that they be rich in good works, that they be ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come so that they may lay hold to eternal life. So what does Paul say that Timothy should charge the rich to do? Invest their money. But invest their money how? In heavenly things, at the cross. This is why he says, they lay up or store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come. That means against the time of judgment. Right? That they may lay hold to eternal life. So verse 18, this is one of the reasons why we have um, the 
these emphases during Advent and Lent, during penitential seasons, in which we have this emphasis of giving, right, of, of giving our money away, because one of the antidotes to trusting in money is giving it away. Maybe not the only antidote, because you can also take pride in how much money you give away, right? But it is an antidote. It's one of them, <laughs> um, is to give money away. And so um, it's important that we see this here and we take this seriously. And yet, we also know, and again, money can be a blessing from God. Money is a blessing from God. Um, and we ought to be ca uh, cautious and careful about how money affects us and careful that we not serve money in our lives. In other words, the way that um, Paul says here to Timothy is that, that they trust not in uncertain riches. Right? Don't put your trust in riches. Don't put your trust in, in the 401k or in the bank account, but put trust in Christ. Okay. So Proverbs has a lot to say about this, a lot to say about money, a lot to say about wealth. Um, and actually, I think, contains all of these sorts of perspectives. Um, because we see here in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22, the blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich, and he addeth no sorrow with it. So what does the blessing of the Lord do? What's it say? The blessing of the Lord does what? Makes us rich. And doesn't add sorrow along with it. Right? It's a blessing to have material things. It is a blessing. Um, again, we, we have heard the cautions, but it's also important we hear this. It's a blessing. Um, and verse 12, 27 says uh, that some of this blessing does come through hard work. 12, verse 27. This is sort of, again, this very practical wisdom of Proverbs. Whoever is slothful will not roast his game, but the diligent man will get precious wealth. Now, this isn't a character we've talked about very much in Proverbs yet, um, but it's a very important character in, in Proverbs, and that is the sloth or the slothful man. Who is the slothful man? The sluggard, he's also called. He's lazy. Why is he called slothful or sluggard? What's a slug like? Slow. Slow. Moves kind of slow. What are sloths like when they move? Slow, deliberate, but not deliberate. Lazy, <laughs> not deliberate, lazy. Um, the sluggard is lazy. He's slothful. Um, I, I didn't put the one on here, right, but one of the main uh, pictures of the sluggard, the slothful man you get is the guy that wakes up, and he's like, ah, a lion might eat me in the, s in the streets, and he goes back to bed. Do you remember that proverb? This, one, this is one of the Proverbs where it says, the sluggard wakes up in the morning and says, ah, a lion's going to eat me in the street, and turns over and goes back to sleep. What's that? Oh, yeah, there's a pandemic out there. Right, back to sleep. Um, right. You have a little fully, uh, yeah, we're, uh, see here later, a little fully in the hands of sleep. Um, the sluggard, the slothful man, is not motivated to do anything. Just feels like, ah, it, it's going to take care of itself or it won't, whatever, I'm going back to sleep. So it, it's, a, it's a type of pleasure seeking that particularly seeks pleasure in rest, right? Um, of selfishness that's focused on rest. And so the slothful man's not gonna roast his game, right? The slothful man, why won't he roast his game? He's gotta chop wood. He's gotta first hunt the game and get it. He's gotta go, game of course is what you hunt, right? In the, in the wild, so he's gotta go hunt and get it. He's going to clean it. He's got to do all this. Right. He's not, he's not doing all this stuff. <laughs> he's not doing that. Right. Right. He, right. He hit the game, but he's not going to, he's not going to roast it. But the diligent man does what? The diligent man, the hardworking man receives precious wealth. Okay. This is a, a very basic common sense proverb that is also common sense of the world, right? Um, you work hard, and you will have good results. And that's, again, generally true. Um, 14, verse 23, in all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to penury. What's that word mean? 
poverty. Tends only toward poverty. So in other words, you got to work. In labor, there's profit. But if you just talk a lot, you just wag the lips, not work, what's going to happen? Tends toward poverty, right? Again, it's a very similar idea here. That hard work leads, and, and labor leads to, leads to, leads to wealth. Yeah, I think that's a good way to say it. Right, that's a good way to say it. So he might start a bunch of things, but never actually brings it to completion. Yeah. But poverty in Proverbs is not always viewed as some sort of moral ill. It's not always the result of the fact the person was the sluggard or the person was slothful. Look at 28 verse 6. Better is the poor that walketh in his uprightness than he that is perverse in his ways, though he be rich. Matt? Right. Yeah, right. I think that's a, a not a bad example. So, I mean, that we see this type of thing that happens today, um, right? But it's better, Proverbs says, to be poor and to have your integrity than to be a person who is corrupt and yet has great riches, has enriched themselves through corruption. Um, verse six, uh, chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, this is another, we're back to the sluggard here. How long will thou sleep, O sluggard? When wilt thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall thy poverty come as one that, tra that traveleth, and thy want as an armed man. Again, you have there linked. Poverty can come from laziness. It can come from being a sluggard. Right? But at the same time, it's better to be a righteous person and to be poor than to be corrupt and be rich. Flip over the page, verse, uh, chapter 14, verse 20. The poor is hated even of his own neighbor, but the rich man hath many friends. What's that proverb about? The poor is hated even of his own neighbor, but the rich hath many friends. Yeah. This is one of those worldly wise proverbs that's saying something. It's not saying this is good. It's saying this is the way of the world. And what's the way of the world? We're attracted to money and repelled by poverty. We, if somebody is rich, what all of a sudden happens? All sorts of friends come around. All sorts of people start coming around. Didn't come around it before. <laughs> well, maybe, yeah. Right, yes, the parable of those who making friends with those who pay you back or those who can't pay you back, right? Absolutely. Um, there was a great article I had about this that maybe I can share with you at one point. It was actually a story, a modern story, of a man who, um, uh, I think he's from West Virginia. He won the lottery. He won the Powerball when it was like, I don't remember how much money it was. Some astronomical, hundred, like $500 million or something, some astronomical amount of money. And all of a sudden, all these people started coming around. And because he was a, a guy who was just like, oh, yeah, sure. He just started giving these gifts to people that would come around. Millions of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars of people that would come around who weren't really his friends, but were just kind of there to get the money. And he was maybe a little gullible. Just gave this money, gave it, gave it, gave it, wasted it. He didn't only give it away, he also just wasted it, just used it up. And he gambled it away, yeah, he gambled, he did all sorts of things, kind of used his money up. And then by the time the article was written, like five or six years after he'd, he, he did the thing where he got the one check instead of getting the installments every, you know, you can like when you do, and he got the one check, and he'd, he'd gone through all the money in like four or five years by the time they wrote the article. 
Yeah, and it was very tragic. His, you know, his family funded drug addiction and all these other things in his family. Um, the rich hath many friends, but I think we're supposed to see here the rich hath many friends. Right? Yeah, there are people that will come around. Some of them are there, uh, they're actually friends, and some of them are there because they say, ah, oh, the rich man, I'm going to go get with him, get what I can get. And as we're to be here, you know, again, Proverbs is moving us toward this wisdom, this worldly wisdom. Um, we're to remember that in Christ, we're to not show partiality, right? So part of that not showing partiality is to not follow this dynamic, right? To not say to the poor man, all right, oh, I'll buy over there. No, I'm going to go for the rich guy. Kevin? Yes, that's a very good point. James says this very explicitly. Yes, Tim? That's a good point. So it, we need to be aware of this dynamic, and we need to be aware of the way that we as humans are sort of drawn to see these things of wealth and poverty. And I think the rest of the teaching of Scripture draws us to resist this dynamic. In terms of covetousness, um, ver chapter 27, verse 20, hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of men are never satisfied. This is a, a pretty common dynamic that um, Proverbs is laying out here, particularly in terms of wealth and, and accumulation. There can kind of be the lie that we can tell ourselves, or certainly that people will tell themselves, which is, if I just get the next thing, then it will be enough. If I just get the next thing, then it will be enough. If I just get the next thing, I'll be satisfied. It's not true true it's that's that's such a a prevalent and deceptive lie and it's a decept it's a deceptive lie because we do get a little thrill when we get the thing that we wanted and that little thrill does last for a little while and because it lasts for a little while the lie is oh it's actually going to satisfy but then it doesn't and then we're on to the next thing and it comes right back. It comes right back. Yeah. That's right. That's right. They never satisfy. And so the eyes of men, I think this is here particularly that fleshly desire for more and more and more, it never, it doesn't satisfy. That's right. Every, so that was, yeah, very good what David said in terms of thinking about these things in terms of the world, the flesh, and the devil, and relating that to all of these good gifts of God. In other words, God gives good gifts, and then what happens is, because of pride and because of our hearts turned towards sin and the temptation of Satan, there is a, a turning of things which are good and taking things which are good and making them ultimate things, taking them out of their portion, out of their context. Um, and this can happen. It happens with good things God gives. It doesn't happen with bad stuff. <laughs> it happens with good stuff that then becomes bad because it's taken out of its place. Right? Um, this is one of the really pervasive and, and um, malicious effects of temptation, uh, why temptation works the way it does. Yeah. 
Yeah, and, and that old adage about power and power corrupting, right? Um, there's temptation. This is why one of the reasons why we're called to pray for our leaders, right? Because there is temptation when you're in power to, to be corrupted, um, to become corrupt. Um, and, uh, and a much lower level, um, there was an interview with the, the football player, Tom Brady. This happened back like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, actually like 15 years ago. So after he'd won his first two or three Super Bowls, and they sat down and interviewed him, and there was like kind of, you could try and get down to like, so what's driving you, Tom Brady? And as he was in this interview, it became clear that he didn't really know what was driving him. He just needed to get the next thing. He just needed to win the next game, just win the next thing. Maybe. And the person was like, do you think that's going to satisfy? And he explicitly said, I don't know. I sure hope it does. I don't know. I sure hope it does. Right? This can happen with all kinds of different stuff, right? That your life can become driven by trying to find the next thing to satisfy. Um, instead of finding satisfaction in Christ. And of course, one of the reasons why this is dangerous is because of what Proverbs says in chapter 23, verses 4 and 5. Labor not to be rich, cease from thine own wisdom, wilt thy set thine eyes upon that which is not, for riches certainly make themselves wings, they fly away as an eagle toward heaven. What's that saying about riches? Easy come, easy go. <laughs> um, you can't put your trust in riches because riches ultimately aren't going to be there, they're not eternal. They can make wings and fly away to heaven. Job is brought low very quickly, right? So he loses his wealth, he loses his, most of his family, he loses his health. And this happens very quickly, but one of the things he loses is his wealth, right? Because the, one of the temptations, right, when Satan comes and accuses him, the thing Satan, one of the things Satan says is, well, you've given him, I mean, you've made him rich. You've given him all these things. That's why he follows you. Right? And that's kind of the, one of the crux of that thing, that contest between God and Satan. So, yeah, so when, when Sam refers to the prosperity gospel, there is this idea that's endemic in American Christianity as a whole, but really in American culture as a whole, I think, but because of the fact that it's endemic in American Christianity, which says that if you are a, and this is spun all sorts of different ways, if you're a faithful person, or if you're a good person, or if you do the right things, if you're favored by God, then you will be rich, or at least bad things will happen to you. You will be wealthy. And part of that is often linked with an idea that because of, this is often how it's thought of, because of what Jesus has done on the cross, if you say with your mouth that you should be rich, then you should be rich, then you will be rich because the Holy Spirit is in God's people. So if you declare it out loud then you, th that you should be rich, then you, then you will become rich. And you should say, declare good things that they'll happen and that's a false gospel. That's not true. <laughs> because the witness of the prophets and the martyrs shows to us that being a faithful person doesn't mean that you're always going to be rich. What it is doing, what that false gospel does is it takes these principles from Proverbs which are true Right? That if you work hard, if you do, uh, if you follow God, then generally, yes, 
And actually, it is true that if you follow God and you trust God, you will receive riches. But when you store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, right? When Jesus comes back, he establishes the new heavens, the new earth. He judges the world in righteousness, peoples with his truth. And yes, there will be rewards given out. And because in eternity, in the new heavens and the new earth, there, it, it's not an ephemeral world. It's a, it's a physical world because there will be a resurrection of our bodies. What that means is, yes, all our needs will be taken care of. We will have all we need and more. And so, this is very pernicious, but the lie of the prosperity gospel says that that future promise is present now, and you just have to claim it, or you just have to get it. And the reason I say that's pernicious is because I... Is be, because if, then, you have a Christian who suffers... Christian who, who is hurting or suffering, then the, the idea then is they must have done something wrong. They didn't claim it correctly. They didn't have enough faith. They didn't do the right thing. And that's why this bad thing happened to them. And that's, no, no, it's not what Paul said. That's, um, and because we, as one of, I, th I think that one of the things that the church has to do is has to prepare people for suffering. Um, the, the church has to prepare people for difficulty. And to say to people that the way they prepare for difficulty is by declaring that they ought to be rich is wrong and wicked. <laughs> and we see this through the life of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was a man who was persecuted and harmed and hurt and beaten. And yet, through that, he walks with Jesus. And this is the witness of the martyrs through church history. This is the witness of those who have come, the apostles. This is the witness of the prophets. This is the witness of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of millions of Christians who have come before us. that's right and and so when I say and I do think that this is a, a very per pernicious thing but when I I say that I want to be clear and I want you to understand that I'm not saying that every sheep um, every Christian who believes this is wicked because they may have been misled by their teachers so 
if you encounter somebody who has this, don't just say, oh, heretic, and write them off. Because they may, <laughs> right, they may not have <laughs> never read James. And it may, right, th they're, um, so I'm just saying, don't, th this is something, again, if, as I'm saying this, we, we don't come with this sort of judgmental attitude toward sheep, toward people who have been misled in this way, because people can be misled. Um, this is why, again, James says, not many of you should be teachers, my brothers, because you know that we'll be judged more strictly. Like, the judgment on that is coming more, <laughs> more severely toward the teachers. So, again, one of our antidotes here for trusting in our riches is devoting our wealth to God. Chapter 3, verses 9 through 10. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of thine increase. So shall thy barns, barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst with new wine. What are you to do with your money? Honor the Lord with it. So that does mean giving tithes and offerings. And Proverbs says that God will take care of people when they honor him. He is going to, um, he's going to care for people. 28, verse 27. He that giveth unto the poor shall not lack, but he that hideth his eyes shall have many a curse. Again, the church is to be giving to those who are poor. 19, verse 27. He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and which he hath given will he pay him again. There's um, an idea there, I think, that's very consonant with what Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, that we store up for ourselves treasures in heaven, right? Or this sort of investment idea that Paul gives in First Timothy. Um, when you give to the poor, by not trusting in your riches, it's like you're, you're tr entrusting it to God, and God notices, and God actually will give rewards, for, for what we do. David? Yeah, right. Right, yes, that's right. So you give, um, you give the tithe, and then uh, on top of that, giving to the, to the poor and the needy. Yeah, sure. And God is very gracious. He does care about our physical state now. You know, we, we see in Scripture over and over again, he cares about the poor. Um, and he cares about those who, ha who have, well, he, he, want, he, he desires our needs to be taken care of. Right? Um, and so we're going to end on this prayer about extremes um, from chapter 30, verses 7 through 9, um, where... He's, uh, I think this is Agar, prays, two things have I required of thee, deny them not before I die, remove far from me vanity and lies, give me neither poverty nor riches, feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord, or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. So the prayer is something like, give me this day my daily bread. Yeah. 
Yeah. Be safe from it. Yeah. To take these warnings about riches. And I think that's it's it's a very wise thing for us to pray that because of the warnings that are given over and over again in Scripture that we be delivered from trusting in our riches. All right, let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word. Please lead us, we pray, in wisdom by your word and by your spirit into what is true and good and beautiful so that in all things we might bring glory to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.